something scary hiding in the back of your closet. Your bathing suits and summer clothes, they you're pretty sure don't fit anymore. What if there was a way to get into summer shape in one visit? Here's Dr. Brian Strand for Sonabello to explain. It really is quite remarkable. Sonabello doctors use a technology called microlaser fat removal, and the results are amazing. We customize your procedure to accomplish your goals. Just share with us the problem areas where you'd like the fat in inches removed. And in one visit, they're gone, permanently. I can't tell you how often I hear clients say how many years they've been trying to diet and exercise those inches away. And we did it in one comfortable visit. It's time to get your summer on. Visit any of our Sonabella locations across the U.S. And right now, you can save $250. Visit sonobello.com slash save. sonobello.com slash save. That's sonobello.com slash save. Hello, and welcome to Campus Crime Chronicles. I'm your host, Nicole Turner, former college professor, current college administrator, but always a true crime addict. In every episode of this podcast, I take a deep dive into some sort of true crime that occurred on a school campus or is associated with a college or university in some way. For each episode, I rate the seriousness of the crime from one to five on my very own serious crime scale, with one being completely not serious, possibly even a little humorous from time to time, to five being very serious. Hey everyone, welcome back and a very happy new year to all of you. <laughs> to kick us off in 2022, this episode, Chronicle 22, is rated a five. It's the story of two separate murders that occurred on the campus of Gallaudet University, a prestigious school in Washington, D.C., the nation's only liberal arts university for the deaf and hard of hearing. The acclaimed university was deemed a safe, happy place with a 10-foot wrought iron fence enclosing the entire 99-acre campus in the heart of D.C., but for students attending the university in the year 2000, they had no idea that Gallaudet would become the hunting grounds for a serial killer in the making. This episode is titled Silent Killings. So without further ado, let's get started. As the freshman class of 2000 at Gallaudet University moved into their dorms that would be their new home over the course of the next few months, one student in particular stood out among the rest. That was a friendly and bubbly young man, 19-year-old Eric Plunkett. As a freshman, Eric quickly made many friends because of his outgoing personality. Basically, everyone who lived on Eric's floor in the dorm not only knew exactly who Eric was, but they were also just drawn to him. Eric, though, wasn't your typical college student. You see, he was born with a congenital disease that caused deafness and a mild form of cerebral palsy. However, according to an episode of People Magazine Investigates titled The Sound of Silence, Eric's disease and physical disabilities didn't slow him down one bit. In fact, he kind of persevered in spite of them, and he was a very, very smart young man. So smart that he was named the salutatorian of his graduating class in May 2000 at the Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf. Eric's father, Craig Plunkett, told People Magazine Investigates that his physical disabilities were basically non-existent in Eric's eyes. Craig said that he didn't think of himself as being handicapped and that Eric was a very determined young man who wanted to be considered a normal kid. And Eric's stepfather, Chris Cornells, said, quote, I never saw the physical challenges hold him back from doing what he wanted to do, end quote. Basically, Eric was just a happy guy who was always looking forward to new adventures, and going to college after high school was one of them. Getting accepted to Gallaudet was an accomplishment in and of itself, because it's a very selective university that only accepts about 2,000 students each year. 
Eric, of course, was determined to get in. And when his acceptance letter from the university arrived in the mail, Eric was so stoked and proud of himself that he framed the letter and hung it on the wall in his family's living room. And when he hung it, he excitedly told his mom that in four years time, he'd replace the letter from Gallaudet with his degree that he'd earned from Gallaudet. So in the fall of 2000, Eric and his parents packed up and made the drive from their home in Minnesota to Washington, D.C. to drop Eric off at college. He moved into a single room, so no roommates, in Cogswell Hall on campus. But as I previously said, Eric's personality allowed him to quickly make friends and his family said he never knew a stranger. Actually, there were a group of guys in their first floor hallway that called their little wing of the dorm the Wild Wild West. And part of that group was Eric, of course, but there were several others as well, including a student who lived a few doors down from Eric, Benjamin Varner, and there was also a guy named Joseph Mesa Jr. who lived across the hall from Eric. Eric, being the popular, outgoing guy that he was, would often keep his door unlocked and even propped open so his friends and dorm mates could stop by and come in and really just come and go whenever they wanted. It was just a true sense of community and togetherness in this dorm with these young men, which is a pretty common occurrence in most residence halls at colleges and universities. With all that being said, you can probably imagine how worried Eric's dorm mates and friends became in late September when Eric's door was suddenly closed and locked, and it remained that way for a few days. It was actually Eric's neighbor from across the hall, Joseph Mesa, who ended up alerting personnel at the school, saying he was concerned because Eric had not shown up for a tutoring session. You see, Mesa had been tutoring Eric in math, and on September 28, 2000, Eric failed to attend a session that was scheduled to begin at 8 p.m. By 8.45 p.m., when Eric was still a no-show, Mesa alerted the resident assistant, or RA, but he also told the RA that he was even more concerned because there was a foul odor coming from Eric's room. Of course, the RA instantly went to check on Eric and knocked on his door, but when he didn't answer, the RA used his master key to unlock the door and get into Eric's room. When he went inside, he saw Eric lying face down in a pool of blood by his head. According to People Magazine Investigates, Cogswell Hall was immediately evacuated and D.C.'s Metro Police Department rushed to the scene. Upon processing the crime scene, because this was clearly and quickly determined to be a murder, police found some of Eric's clothing and his glasses near his body, and it appeared that Eric had been brutally beaten with a chair that was in the room. In fact, there was a ton of blood spatter on the leg of that chair, and police soon determined that not only was this a murder, but it was a personal murder by someone who knew Eric because there was definitely overkill involved, which they said is consistent with incredible rage and anger. Police also determined that Eric was initially choked and strangled before he was beaten with the chair. But the big question lingering was, why? What was the motive? Who could possibly want to kill this incredibly kind, caring, outgoing person? And who would want to kill him? Who would want to do it? And police, well, they didn't have much to go on in generating leads either. But first things first, police had to tell Eric's parents that their son, whom they just safely dropped off at college a few weeks ago, was now dead. According to People Magazine Investigates, Eric's parents were awakened the next morning at about 2 a.m. by a loud knock on their door, and that's when police delivered the terrible news. Eric's mother, Kathleen Cornells, said, quote, I took my son to college and he's not coming back. That was what kept going through my head, end quote. Meanwhile, as the investigation continued back at Gallaudet University, students were walking around incredibly terrified by the fact that a murderer was on the loose, perhaps even still on campus living among them. One former student told People Magazine that everyone kept looking at each other in suspicion, like, did you do it? Or did you do it? And the whole campus just no longer felt safe like it used to. 
Police quickly set up a command post on campus and begin digging into Eric's background. They interviewed his friends and students close to him, both figuratively and literally. Like, of course, they interviewed those who were good friends with him, but they also interviewed those who lived near him to try to find out something, anything that could help them figure out who could have possibly done such a horrible thing and why they did it. However, the interviews weren't as simple as you might think. Not because of the sheer nature of the circumstances, but because actual communication during their interviews was a bit of a challenge that police never really had to face before. According to one investigator who was interviewed by People Magazine, communication was hard because of the fact that the students were deaf or hard of hearing, which meant the usual facial expressions that go along with like voice tones that literally police are trained to pay attention to during interviews to try to pick up something. Well, all of that was basically non-existent, which is, like I said, actually pretty important when investigating murder cases. So instead... They had to have a sign language interpreter in the interviews with them, and they literally had to take all the statements and information from the students at face value. Police, however, did end up zeroing in on one student in particular after another student told them that they thought Eric was in a romantic relationship with a student by the name of Thomas Minch. And other students told police they saw Eric and Thomas arguing in Eric's dorm room a few days before his body was found. So, of course, police focused on Thomas and brought him in for questioning. They pressed Thomas about his relationship with Eric, but Thomas told them he and Eric were not in a relationship at all. He said they were just friends, but police told him several students were saying the opposite, that they were more than just friends. Thomas explained to them, though, exactly what happened and how it happened. He said, quote, Eric had invited me to come to his room just to sit and chat, and he was trying to make some moves on me. And I had told him, wait a second, we're good friends. I would rather not go that far. And he kept just trying to push it a little bit, end quote. And Thomas even admitted to pushing and hitting Eric after Eric made the pass at him. But Thomas said this happened at least a week before his death, and he hadn't really seen Eric since that particular encounter. And with every fiber of his being, he adamantly denied killing Eric. Also, Thomas Minch had an alibi during the exact time of the murder. He was actually at theater rehearsal during the time that police believe Eric was killed. Still, though, police weren't buying his story, and they believed he still had enough time after the rehearsal ended to commit the murder. Police also believed the unwanted past that Eric made toward Thomas was enough of a motive to murder, and they arrested Thomas Minch. Thomas said, quote, and then they're saying they are filing federal charges, and I was so thrown off by that. I said, I'm sorry, what are you talking about? I did not do this, end quote. But here's the thing. Police didn't have much to go on to actually charge Thomas for murder. Like, they had zero evidence. Plus, Thomas had a rather strong alibi that people could actually vouch for him. Like, hey, he was here at the theater, not anywhere near Cogswell Hall at the time. And the DA was in complete agreement because he actually refused to move forward with the case. He found no probable cause at all and refused to charge Thomas Mitch. But police still had zero other leads, so they remained suspicious of Thomas and kept him close to their radar. And it was because of these ongoing suspicions that Gallaudet University actually banned Thomas Mitch from campus. So after he was released from jail but couldn't go back to school, he had nowhere else to go besides back home to his parents in the state of New Hampshire, where he was from. Meanwhile, police continued their investigation. But during this time, Eric Plunkett's family received an interesting package from Gallaudet University. Inside were Eric's belongings that had been packed up from his dorm room and sent back to them. But included in those belongings were some bank transactions specifically debit card transactions from September 28th, 2000. Wait, what? His parents didn't understand because Eric wasn't alive on September 28th. Yes, if you remember, 
He was found in his dorm room on September 28th, but police determined he had actually been dead for at least two to three days. So there was no way Eric could have made those transactions. And this meant it was very likely that whoever used Eric's debit card was also Eric's killer. After receiving the package and bank records, Eric's family was more confused and frustrated than ever. Kathleen Cornell's Eric's mother, told People Magazine that it was like a roller coaster ride of emotions. They were so close to finding his killer, and they even had a person in custody, Thomas Minch, who was allegedly responsible. So his parents just didn't understand how they could just let him go and drop the charges. But... What both police and Eric's family didn't know was that Thomas Minch wasn't responsible for the crime at all. And they soon found this out when terror struck Gallaudet University again, just a few months later in the wee hours of the morning on February 3rd, 2001, a time when Minch was at home in Greenland, New Hampshire, nowhere near the grounds of Gallaudet. On this day, at about 4.15 a.m., February 3rd, residents of that same dormitory, Cogswell Hall, were awoken by a fire alarm. Everybody came out of their rooms to make their way outside, except for one student. That student was 19-year-old Benjamin Varner, who you might remember because I mentioned him earlier in the episode because he was friends with Eric and he lived near Eric. But Varner came to Gallaudet from San Antonio, Texas. When Benjamin didn't come out of his room, though, the RA, the same RA who found Eric Plunkett, by the way, unlocked Benjamin's room to check on him after he didn't come out for the fire alarm. Once again, the RA found a very similar situation as he found back in September. But this time, the scene was much, much more gruesome. Benjamin's body was on the floor with a mattress pulled over him, and the room was covered in blood splatter. Police and FBI both showed up this time to process the scene, and they documented that this murder involved a much bigger struggle between the victim and the killer, which was primarily because Benjamin had a much larger stature than Eric did. But just like the first murder, this one, too, was a violent overkill attack. This time, though, there was a trail of evidence left behind. So police quickly began collecting all they could, including multiple types of DNA. Woo. Apparently, police discovered that Benjamin's killer left in a hurry, and he also left behind hair and fiber evidence, as well as bloody shoe prints that tracked from Benjamin's dorm room down the hallway and then toward a dumpster outside where they actually found a heavy coat and a knife with blood on it, both of which, police believe, belonged to the killer who had disposed of the items. Obviously, students at Gallaudet were in full-on panic mode by this time and living in a constant state of fear and terror, especially because now there had officially been two murders in the same dormitory on the same floor. Y'all, I'd be running so fast out of that dorm, you'd think I was like the Flash or something. I honestly don't know how any students stayed there after Eric's murder, but especially after the second murder, I would just, I would be creeped out. So I can't imagine how those students were feeling. Anyway, back to the story. <laughs> Police still had no suspects on their radar except for Thomas Minch. But how could he have possibly done this when he wasn't even in town? Well, y'all, he was in town, which piqued their suspicions of him even more. So allow me to explain. According to People Magazine Investigates, Thomas was in D.C. during the time of Benjamin's murder because he was ordered to give a handwriting sample in Eric Plunkett's case. So he was in town at the time, providing a grand jury with the handwriting sample they requested, which was actually despite Thomas's attorney's objection to provide it. So when police learned he was in D.C., he went right back to the top of their list of being the prime suspect of not just one, but now two different murders. Police speculated that at some point while he was there, he must have gone back onto campus and murdered Benjamin Varner. So naturally, because they had DNA evidence this time, they asked Thomas to provide a DNA sample. And Thomas, still denying his involvement in any way, 
jumped at the opportunity to prove himself innocent and allowed them to swab his cheek for DNA. And guess what? The DNA was not a match to the DNA evidence they found in Benjamin's room. So Thomas Minch was officially cleared and ruled out as a suspect. Now, though, police had to start from square one, you know, since they basically were not looking at any other people as suspects. And now detectives had to consider who had access to both Eric's and Benjamin's rooms because there was no forced entry. So they first took a look at a different Thomas, not Thomas Minch, but remember that poor RA who was no doubt traumatized from discovering not one, but two dead bodies? Well, his name is also Thomas, and they took a good hard look at him after Thomas Minch was cleared, but a DNA sample quickly ruled him out as well. So on to the next. At JCPenney's Memorial Day sale, sizzling deals are on with storewide doorbusters all weekend. Or bring home savings up to 50% during our Memorial Day home sale. Save even more with your coupon. And for all former and active military personnel, enjoy an extra 10% off in-store. Just show a valid military or VA ID at checkout. Shopping is back. JCPenney. Coupon valid on select styles through 530. Some exclusions apply. Doorbusters valid 526 through 530 and excluded from coupons. See store or jcp.com for details. It's official, summer is almost here. The sun is getting brighter, the days are getting longer, and your yard is ready for some love. Make sure your flower beds and bushes can handle the heat with special savings on EarthGrow Mulch. Keep the sun off your soil and water in the ground, plus add a fun pop of color that will last up to 12 months. Hurry in. EarthGrow Mulch. Five bags for just 10 bucks. Feels like Memorial Day at the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Valid May 19th to 30th. In-store only. Color selection varies by store. Limit 75 per customer. As detectives were continuing to interview and re-interview students at Gallaudet, they soon received a clue from the FBI crime lab. Remember those bloody footprints? Well, from those shoe prints that trailed from the scene of the crime to the dumpster outside, investigators were able to determine that the brand of shoes the killer was wearing was Nike Air Max sneakers. Now, while this was a good clue, of course, they still needed to investigate something else. You see, Benjamin's wallet had been stolen during the murder as well, which appeared to be the possible motive now that everything was coming to light. So police needed to look into Benjamin's finances and bank activity. They ended up discovering a check for $650 with a memo line that read, used laptop. And this check was cashed on February 2nd. Even though Benjamin's body was found February 3rd, detectives learned that Benjamin had failed to show up for classes as well as a doctor's appointment on February 2nd, which led them to believe he was killed sometime during the night of February 1st. Obviously, they needed to find out who the heck cashed this check, so police asked the bank for video security footage from the date it was cashed. But while they were waiting on the footage, they received a ginormous tip from local media. You see, they put out a photo of the coat they had found in the dumpster, which all the major TV stations in D.C. aired. And one student from Gallaudet saw the coat on TV and reported that his roommate had a coat just like the one in the photo. His roommate was Joseph Mesa Jr. If that name sounds familiar too, well, it should. Remember, Mesa was the one who alerted the RA that Eric Plunkett had missed their tutoring session And he was the one who said he smelled a foul odor coming from Eric's room. Mesa was a friend and neighbor in Cogswell Hall to both Eric and Benjamin. But police were confused, to say the least. I mean, they had interviewed Mesa twice, and they had no indication he was involved at all. Regardless, though, they followed up on the lead and began digging deeper into Mesa. It wasn't long before they began collecting all the corroborating evidence they needed to officially arrest Mesa. For starters, they searched his dorm room and collected shoes from his closet that, you guessed it, were Nike Air Max sneakers and matched the shoe prints at the crime scene perfectly. There was also still some blood on the shoes too, which matched Benjamin Varner's DNA. Then, on top of all of this, they finally received the surveillance footage from the bank, and guess who was very visible and identifiable? If you said Joseph Mesa, you'd of course be right. (laughs) 
When police began searching for Mesa, though, they actually didn't have to search very hard because to their complete surprise, Mesa actually came to them. On February 14th, 2001, investigators interviewed Mesa at D.C.'s Metropolitan Police Department headquarters. During the interview, Mesa actually gave a full confession of his crimes. He confessed to both of the murders. He sat in the room and gave a videotaped confession in sign language as an interpreter sat across from him. Now, I'm going to tell you guys exactly what he said, but y'all, fair warning, it is not easy to hear and it is very emotionless and quite disturbing. So, like I always say, if you don't think you can handle it, I recommend skipping ahead a bit. But here we go. Mesa, in his confession, said, quote, I know that I have made a big mistake. It was time for me to go directly to the D.C. police and talk to them rather than holding it in. Two weeks ago, Thursday night, I walked to Cogswell to the first floor. I rang the bell. Ben opened the door. He invited me in. I went in, closed the door, and I asked if he had a checkbook. And Ben said he did. He asked me why, and I just told him I was curious. That was all. I walked over and I saw a knife right under the microwave and I had the knife and I got ready and I stabbed him. First, I stabbed him in the neck on the right side when he was sitting at the computer. Then we moved over here. I stabbed him again in the cheek. So then he tried to turn around and tried to get away. And then I blocked him from getting out to the door. I've got him down and I put my arm around his neck and I stabbed him in the eye. The last place I stabbed him was in the head and I left it there. But then he was defending himself. Then I cut his throat. I kicked him in his head two times. Then his blood got on my shoes. I looked for the checkbook. It was in the first drawer. End quote. Y'all, if that doesn't make your blood boil a little and give you the creeps just a little, I don't know what does. Anyway, a detective then proceeded to question him further. He asked Mesa why he continued to stab Benjamin, what his intention was exactly. Like, why would he do that? Mesa responded and told the detective that after he stabbed Benjamin in the neck, Benjamin looked up at him and Mesa said he felt a sudden guilt wash over him. However, Mesa continued, he knew if Benjamin lived, he'd report Mesa right away. So he had to kill him so he couldn't tell anyone what happened. Mesa said he felt more and more guilt because Benjamin was staying alive. As in, y'all, he wouldn't die. So Mesa said when Benjamin finally did succumb to his injuries, he was relieved. Oh, that is so crazy. I just, I can't get over how emotionless this guy is. Anyway, after he confessed to murdering Benjamin Varner, Mesa then proceeded to confess and explain how he killed Eric Plunkett as well. And again, it's not easy to hear, so... Do your skip ahead thing if you need to. But Mesa told investigators, quote, I thought, what am I going to do? I need to get some money. I thought Eric's alone. I knew he was kind of weak. So I saw that Eric's door was open and Eric was sitting at the computer. I put my arm around his neck, kept holding it there continuously. And then he breathed slower and slower. Then he laid down. Then I kicked him and kicked him. And I used the chair and hit him in his face. I looked for the credit card, found it put it in my pocket, and I left him laying there, dead, end quote. Ah, <sighs> what the hell? <sighs> anyway, I promise I'll get through this episode, you guys. I promise. <laughs> it's just, this guy is so creepy to me. Anyway, moving on. One of the detectives working the case, James La Franchise, or I think it's French, so it's sort of, I, I can't even do a French accent you guys so i'm not even going to try but it's it sound it looks like it's pronounced law franchise so james la franchise said mesa was so cold and emotionless in his descriptions and he said there is no doubt in his mind that mesa would have killed again if he had the opportunity he was basically a serial killer in the making and you'd think that because they had a full length videotaped confession from this guy, that it would be an open and shut case against Mesa. But unfortunately, it wasn't that simple. Why, you ask? Because Mesa and his legal defense came up with a doozy of a story that surprised and baffled everyone. Y'all, 
<laughs> this fool started playing the insanity card and claiming he was not mentally fit to stand trial. So he said he shouldn't be responsible for his actions. But let me tell you the shit Mesa came up with. He said that black leather hands started talking to him in sign language and telling him to kill these young men and take their money. He said these black hands were gloves worn by the professional wrestler, The Undertaker. Y'all, he said The Undertaker was wearing black leather gloves and instructing him in sign language on what to do. I cannot make this stuff up. Clearly, this was so bizarre that even the judge didn't know what to do with this information. So the judge was just like, uh, after those comments, yeah, you definitely need to be checked out. So the judge committed Mesa to St. Elizabeth's Hospital, where a team of psychologists could examine his mental competence before trial. Over the next four months, psychologists monitored Mesa and his behavior 24 hours a day. But... Guess what he never talked about during those whole four months? The black gloved hands, of course. But guess what he did talk about? All the violent and messed up shit he'd done as he was growing up. One psychologist, Mitchell Huguenet, said he noted that Mesa had violent tendencies and violent incidences in the past. As a child, they discovered, Mesa even killed a mother cat and her kittens, and he had no empathy or remorse about it whatsoever. The psychologist said he could see that Mesa had a, quote, distinctly pleasurable emotional connection, end quote, to the recollections of killing the animals. Basically, he said, Mesa appeared to be happy when he talked about killing. Again, that is bone chilling, creepy, y'all. Like it just, ugh, the mind of this guy. Anyway, upon completion of those four months, psychologists determined that Mesa met the standard for understanding wrongfulness and being able to control his behavior. They determined he was indeed mentally fit to stand trial. Huguenet, the psychologist or one of the psychologists, told People Magazine Investigates, quote, he was not crazy. He exhibited strong characteristics of a psychopathic serial killer who, but for one more murder, would have met the FBI definition for that. He was a serial killer caught early in his career. End quote. Mace's 10-day trial for the murders of Eric Plunkett and Benjamin Varner began in May of 2002. According to the reporting of Arthur Santana for the Washington Post, Mesa, then 22, sat expressionless and basically emotionless in the courtroom the whole time. But remember those gloved hands Mesa pulled out of thin air, but then never mentioned again while he was at the psychiatric facility? Well, they suddenly appeared again at the trial. In Mesa's mind, at least, I don't, I mean, I don't know what was happening. <laughs> but at one point during his testimony, he even told the prosecuting attorney, Jeb Bosberg, that the gloved hands were telling Mesa to kill him, Bosberg. And Bosberg said, quote, you are thinking about attacking me, but you've been able to control yourself. You haven't attacked me, have you? End quote. And Mesa simply replied through a sign language interpreter, not yet. <sighs> Everything about this guy literally creeps me out. <sighs> anyway, and some new information was also presented at the trial. Apparently, while he was in jail, Mesa wrote some letters to his girlfriend, Melanie de Guzman, telling her he was planning to fake insanity during the trial. He asked her to get rid of the letters, but being young and dumb and in love, apparently, she decided to hold on to them, but to the police's advantage. Because when they searched her dorm room on campus, because, duh, if you're dating an alleged murderer, of course your place will be searched. <laughs> but anyway, they found the letters in her dorm room, which they presented as evidence at the trial. And clearly, the jury wasn't buying any of Mesa's bullshit delusions either, because after only three hours of deliberation, they found Mesa guilty on all counts. The judge then sentenced Mesa to six life terms, plus 90 additional, 90, nine, zero additional years in prison. Thank God. 
As we know, I do not like to end my episodes with information about the convicted felons. I like to end on positive notes about the victims, and of course, this episode is no different. According to People Magazine Investigates, Gallaudet University ended up awarding both Eric Plunkett and Benjamin Varner posthumous degrees, which meant Eric's parents could replace his acceptance letter with his degree after all. I also want to leave you with some words from Eric Plunkett's stepfather, Chris Cornells, who I think we can all gain a little perspective from. He told People Magazine Investigates, quote, I have gone through the journey of making peace with things, and I've learned that forgiveness is not to interact with malice in my heart. Joseph Mesa Jr., I forgive you for what you did to Eric, end quote. Okay, y'all, that officially brings us to the end of Chronicle 22, the first chronicle of the new year of 2022. So as always, be sure to check out this podcast on social media where I always post photos associated with each case and episode. You can find me at Campus Crime Podcast on Instagram and Campus Crime Chronicles on Facebook. But also, (laughs) I have some important announcements, just a couple before I officially wrap up. First, I have a big surprise for y'all on my one year podcast anniversary, which is coming up. Yeah, I totally made up that word, but <laughs> my one year anniversary um, of the podcast is coming up just right around the corner on March 1st. And so I have a big surprise slash unveiling for y'all. <laughs> so stay tuned. But I also want to tell you something else. As most of you know, my podcast, it's it's steadily growing, I would say. It's not growing super quickly, but it's it's growing consistently. And I'm picking up a, at least a few new listeners with every new episode, which is amazing because I'm pretty sure it's totally from word of mouth from you guys. So thank you all for that. But also, as most of you guys probably know, it takes time and money and time. And did I mention it takes a lot of time (laughs) to write and record and research and produce all of these chronicles. But as you guys also know, I'm also working on a dissertation on top of, you know, a full-time job at a college. So yeah, it's just, it's so much. And with that, (laughs) I officially have a way for you to support me and continue to get the content you love from Campus Crime Chronicles. No, it's not a Patreon just yet, but again, hold on for that. (laughs) But it is an official donation page associated with the podcast. I'm on a new hosting site called redcircle.com that allows my listeners to directly help me out by making either a one-time donation, or if you wanted to set up a recurring donation, there's an option for that too. Now, don't worry, I promise I won't bug your ears all the time about this, but I did just want to mention it because it's it's new and something that I'm it's something new that I'm trying. So um I just wanted to mention it so you guys know it's out there. And if you're ever feeling a little generous and you want to help out a startup slash growing podcast, then the option is always there for you. So from now on, I'll include a direct link to the donation page in the show notes. So you can simply click on the link and it'll take you directly to my red circle page so you can make your donation. If if you so choose to, no pressure. <laughs> but no, you guys are awesome and I love bringing you this content. It just, it, it again, it takes a lot of time and effort and even money. So all any help I can get. I'm I'm very, I would be very gracious. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to quit talking your ears off. That's all for today. So bye for now. Campus Crime Chronicles is researched, written, and recorded by me, Nicole Turner, and it's edited and produced by Big Mad Media. Tune in again in two weeks for the next Chronicle.
It was a night like any other. You ate some dinner, chatted with the family. Then, suddenly, you were gone. But they didn't need to worry. You just snuck off for a second to play Best Fiends. Best Fiends is the mobile puzzle adventure game you want to play for hours on end, even when you only have a few moments to spare. From the vibrant artwork and adventure pack storyline to the cute collectible characters and supercharged power-ups, Best Fiends is designed to be the most obsession-worthy game ever. There are literally thousands of levels, plus tons of in-game events added every month for even more ways to win. And the best part is, you can play anytime, anywhere. No Wi-Fi? No problem. Of course, people may start to wonder about your mysterious disappearances until they see how much much fun you're having. Download your new favorite getaway, Best Fiends, for free on the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Play Best Fiends.